Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is called Three Days That Changed the World. It is also going to tie into my commentary of the book of Hosea, chapter number 6. Now, in Hosea chapter 5, God pronounced judgment upon his people Israel for disobedience. Now, before I go into the three days that changed the world, perhaps we should find out why. Why is the Lord so harsh on Israel? Now, and if you're thinking Israel is a piece of land in the Middle East with a bunch of antichrists that live there, well, you might be sadly mistaken. And if you don't know what an antichrist is, I suggest you read, well, I suggest you read 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar? question. Who's a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And if you don't know what group of people deny that Jesus is the Christ, well, may I suggest you call your local synagogue and ask them if Jesus is the Christ. And, uh, well, psh, take a guess, people. Uh, if they did believe Jesus was the Christ, they'd be Christians, right? But they're not. And if you don't have the Son, you most certainly don't have the Father that sent his only begotten Son. Now, there's only one group of people in this world that are antichrist. So let's start in Exodus chapter 19. This is going to be this is going to be a good Bible study. This really is. I'm just been finding some things out. Um, every time I do a Bible study, the research that I do, I find seems like every time I find something new that I didn't know before. So, And what I really love is some of the comments. On, you know, some people never read the comments on their channel. Of course, I'm small enough that I generally try to read every comment. Sometimes I don't get notifications from YouTube, but uh, some of the People that comment on my channel are very, very well informed. And I learn a lot of things from those that leave comments. And for that, I'm grateful. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Let's find out why the Lord is so harsh on Israel for disobedience. Exodus 19, 1 and verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Do you know that Sinai, how do you spell Sinai? S-I-N, sin, S-I-N-A-I. Now, this is when Israel left Egypt the first Passover. This is the background. All right, verse 2. For they, Israel, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Ah, here we go. 
Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now remember, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So, Jacob and Israel are pretty much interchangeable. All right, verse 4. God says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Remember, all the plagues of Egypt. Now, I did a Bible study comparing and contrasting the plagues of Egypt with the plagues God pours out upon Babylon in the book of Revelation. Very, very similar in a lot of ways. Actually, the plagues of Egypt were basically a challenge to the gods of Egypt. I mean, you had... Uh, three, you know, the days of darkness. That was a challenge to the uh, sun god, the Egyptian sun god called Ra. You know, it was basically a challenge showing God's power and might. And he says, How I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, did Israel climb up on a, a giant eagle and fly away? No. It's a figure of speech, people. Where do we see this figure of speech? Well, we see this in Revelation 12, during the tribulation period. Let's take a look real quick at Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth! And of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. Now, who's the woman? Well, Specifically, Mary was the woman that brought forth the man-child, which was Christ. But figuratively, the woman is the bride of Christ. And if you think it's the Antichrist over in the Middle East, you would probably be wrong. So, the dragon's going to persecute the woman. Verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Didn't we just read that in Exodus? Yeah, we did. Just like in the Egyptian captivity, well, the persecution. When, they, when Israel was in slavery in Egypt and they were being persecuted, well, God uses the same symbolic language in the Old Testament to explain the New Testament. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. Isn't that what, when Israel left Egypt, they went into the wilderness? That she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, a year, and times, two more years, and half a time, half a year, from the face of the serpent. See, during the tribulation period, it's going to be the church that's going to be suffering. People think, oh, no, that's not, God would never do that to us. We're not under God's wrath. Well, if you're in Christ, you're right. You're not under God's wrath. But it's not going to be God persecuting the woman. It's going to be the dragon. It's going to be the devil, Satan. So there's going to come a time when Christians are going to have to leave all the cities and go into the wilderness. That's just the way it is, people. So, all right, let's go back to Exodus. 
verse 4. And ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, here's the punchline. Why is God so rough on Israel? Verse 5. Now therefore, if, I-F, if, ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now let's take a look at this peculiar treasure real quick. Deuteronomy 14.2 for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above, above all the nations that are upon the earth. Deuteronomy 26, 18. And the Lord hath avouch thee this day to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. Psalms 135.4 For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us, who? Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's right, people. Christ gave himself to us. He died for us. Now let's go back to Exodus. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That was verse 5. Now let's read verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. A holy nation a kingdom of priests. Huh. Where do we read that in the New Testament? Wow! I guess what I found. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, these people that tell you don't bother reading the Old Testament, uh, they're idiots at, at best and fools and deceivers at the worst. All right, so God says if if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So what what's, what's comes next? Verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Ah, here's the punchline. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Liars, liars, pants on fire. Because they didn't do it. All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Oh yeah, we're going to keep, obey his voice and keep his covenants. And then we're going to teach our children and teach our children's children. Wrong. They didn't. 
You see, they made a, co uh, a covenant with the Lord. They made a contract with the Lord. They made him a promise. All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. What does sanctify mean? It means to set something apart. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, dishes in the kitchen and you got company coming, well, you're going to set apart the clean dishes for the company and leave the dirty dishes in the sink. You know, that's, you know, I, I'm just, first thing that came to my mind. And he says, let them wash their clothes. Now, this is symbolic. They're washing to be clean on the outside. But really, God wants us clean on the inside. But, you know, we're talking the old covenant. Now, here's another important point. Verse 11. And be ready against the third day. The third day. Three days that are going to change the world. Wait till we get to the New Testament. And be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it. Well, this is a holy mountain, and us as filthy sinners, we can't touch the holy mountain, right? There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall be surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Uh, in other words, don't have intimate relations with your wives. 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended from it in fire. Oh boy, wait till the end times. You think this is scary, boy. Ooh, wait until the Lord comes in glory with fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. You know, people, this is, this is the same kind of language that Revelation uses uh, for the return of Christ. And verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves lest the Lord break forth unto the, upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up 
unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. So, people, you may not know it, but Moses and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi. They were the tribes, they were the tribe of the priests. They were the ones that were to serve God in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. King David was of the tribe of Judah. They were the tribe of the kings. So, Levites, the Levites were to be the religious rulers and the king was to be the civil ruler. So, there was a difference. All right, so let's take a look. All right, three days, right? Let's take a look at Jonah, the book of Jonah. All right, let's go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Now some people say Tarshish is Spain. Uh, that's what I believed for a while. But somebody else pointed out it could possibly be Britain. So God told Jonah to go one direction, but he went the opposite. You know, it's like, okay, Jonah, I want you to go left, and then he goes right. I don't know. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Oh yeah, try running away from God. It doesn't work. I found that out, believe it or not. Almost cost me my life. But uh, yeah, verse 4. But the Lord set out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. In other words, they took all the cargo and threw it overboard because the ship was heavy. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? In other words, what do you think you're doing sleeping? He says, Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is, come up, uh, is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. I guess they were uh, drawing straws, right? So they say, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was temptuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. 
Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O God, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So, because they, they figure, hey, if we if we throw this guy overboard, he's going to die. You know, and they're like, please don't lay this death upon us. Verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Wouldn't that be scary? I mean, here it is. You got like a, a typhoon and you throw this guy into the sea, and all of a sudden the sea turns calm. Oh boy. I think I'd be scared if I was these guys. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Some people say a whale. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah... Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Very important. Why three days and three nights? Now, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees, so basically the Jews are, you know, they're, Denominations of Jews. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. In other words, they're asking Jesus to show them a magic trick, right? A miracle. They think it's a magic trick, but, you know, it was a miracle from God. But he, Jesus, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, which is the Greek rendering of the word uh, Jonah. Verse 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What does that mean? God, the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? You know, that's a whole study in and of itself. And I think I'm going to cover it here. The men of Nineveh, that was the capital of Assyria, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment against this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, if anybody's interested, I did a Bible study on Jonah. A lot of people think Jonah didn't want to preach to the uh, Ninevites, the Assyrian Empire, because they were a very cruel and evil people. But I don't believe that. I think he was a very brave soul that wanted to see God's judgment upon Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. And he didn't want to preach to them because he wanted them to be destroyed of the Lord. Because guess what? Northern Israel, with their capital of Samaria, they were taken into captivity by the Assyrian Empire. They were just, their form of government was destroyed by them. So, I don't know, a little bit of history there. All right, now we're going to do Hosea chapter 6. This is a continuation of the Hosea commentary, but three days plays into this. I, you can make a, an entire Bible study on just the three days, but I'm going to tie it into the book of Hosea. 
All right, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come. Now, oh, let me back this up just a little bit. Hosea chapter 5, God pronounced judgment upon Israel. And we had studied previously where Israel had promised to obey the Lord's voice and to keep his commandments and his covenant, which they didn't. So that's why in Hosea 5, God pronounced judgment upon them. But what's wonderful about the word of the Lord is that after he pronounced judgment, he offers his hand out in mercy for those that seek him. And that's what we're going to see right here. Hosea 6, verse 1. Come, and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Three days that change the world, people. What does this mean? After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. We're going to come back to this, people. This is a very very important point. This is Old Testament, but he's saying in the third day he's going to raise us up. You know, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, right? Christ said that three days he'd be in the heart of the earth. So we're going to tie all this together, but let's keep reading Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. We'll go back. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? Now Ephraim was the main tribe of northern Israel, their capital in Samaria. He says, O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. Therefore I have hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I, now this is the Lord, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they like men, but they like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity and is polluted with blood. And as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have seen an horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, he hath set an harvest for thee when I returned the captivity of my people. Now, if you do a Bible study on numbers, you will find, and I'm not talking about the book of numbers, I'm talking about numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, you'll find that the number three figures prominently in the Bible. Number one, um, let's see, 10, 12, 24, 40. Those are all numbers associated with good things. 
Uh, the numbers 9, 11, and 13 are associated with not so good of things. But uh, three days. So, in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 29. And he, Jesus, and he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, Peter didn't like this, but, you know, what can I tell you? So, Christ would be killed and after three days rise from the dead. Three days. That changed the world. All right, let's take a look at the book of John, chapter 2. Oh, verse 18. The Jews are speaking to Christ. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto, said unto them, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. You see, people, Christ is the high priest. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the king. And you better go to the temple and have a blood sacrifice, which was his death. Uh, you know, <laughs> in 70 AD, the Roman army came and destroyed the temple and absolutely destroyed it. Every stone was cast down upon another, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24. And when the, Ro and when the Jews do their little uh, thing at the wailing wall, they're basically telling everybody that Christ was a false prophet and a liar. The wailing wall is not the temple. The temple was destroyed. Every stone was cast down, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24. So, why, why three days? What's up with three days? Now, remember, in Matthew 12, 40, we read, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what's Christ doing for these three days? Well, let's take a look. All right, well, let's read a little bit about the crucifixion of Christ. So Jesus said he was going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So let's go to Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his, parted his garments. So they crucified him, right? And parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Samach, Lama Sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Jesus is speaking probably in Hebrew. Some people will argue that it's Aramaic. I don't know. I'm not a language scholar. But the Bible interprets the Bible. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, I just thought of something. Why did he say that twice? Eli, Eli, my God, my God. Father, Holy Spirit. You got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? So he's saying to the Father and to the Holy Ghost, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, verse 47. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. Now, he's saying, My God, my God, and they're saying, Oh, he's calling for Elias. Well, they, they don't even understand Hebrew here or Aramaic. You know, he's saying, my God, my God. And they're saying, this man calleth for Elias. So when you hear people say that, oh, all these people spoke Hebrew and Aramaic back in these days, I, don't, I just don't get it. They didn't even understand what Christ was saying. So, verse 48. And, li and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, and let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. See, the temp, the veil of the temple was no longer needed. The veil was ripped from the top, heaven, to the bottom, to the earth. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Oh boy. So you got darkness, the earth's quaking, the rocks are breaking. Verse 52, listen to this. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Whoa, dude, resurrection time. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which, saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. So after the third day, the graves were opened, the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. What kind of story would these people be telling? 
well, yeah, I was dead, but then Christ, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to hear that story. I can only imagine what they were saying. And according to legend, the Pharisees had these people put to death because they didn't want them walking around telling people about Jesus. So, verse 54. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him, now a centurion was a Roman soldier, watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So even the Roman centurions had more sense than the Pharisees. All right, so... Jesus said that he'd be killed, and after three days he'd rise again, in Mark 8, verse 31, right? So, and he also said that, um, in Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, what was he doing for those three days and three nights in the earth? What was he doing? Well, let's find out. All right, so let's go to Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. Now, there's people who tell you that this is a parable, but I don't think so because they're, the man's named by name, okay? Jesus never uses a name of an actual person in a parable. Verse 19. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Purple is the color of royalty. He wore nice clothing, fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. In other words, he ate very well. Verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Do you know that when you die, or at least when this one died, he was carried by the angels? Wow. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now remember, Abraham was called the friend of God. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell, and in hell. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Evidently, the rich man is not in the same place that Abraham is, but yet he can see Abraham. Verse 24, And he, the rich man, and he cried and said, Father Abraham. Ah, this guy was a, was, a, was a child of Abraham. I mean, why else would he say Father Abraham? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You know, people, this verse alone kills the false doctrine of soul sleep. Think about it. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, Abraham acknowledged that this man was one of his children. 
But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between, you, uh, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, there's a, a division. You know, you've heard of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you know, it's they can't, you know, they can't pass over, he says. So, he says, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Well, he at least cared enough about his brothers that he was going to, you know, send somebody to, to warn them, right? Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Remember when the graves were open and they went into Jerusalem? Did, uh, did the chief priests and the Pharisees repent? For the most part, probably not. Now, remember, Christ said he was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, guess what, people? Abraham's bosom. All the Old Testament saints either went to hell, the flames, or Abraham's bosom. Now, Abraham was called the friend of God. Abraham and the people with him were not being tormented. But the rich man was. So what did Christ do for the three days and three nights that he was in the heart of the earth? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3 gives us the answer. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Christ is the just and the unjust, well, that's me. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right, so in verse 19, by which also he, Jesus, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What spirits in prison? Now, well, some people will tell you that he went and preached unto the fallen angels. I don't believe that. No way by which also he, Jesus, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Abraham's bosom was a prison. Okay? I mean, let's face it. It was. Now, people say, oh, well, we're not spirits. Well, people, we were made in God's image. And the Bible records you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. You know, that's just the way it is. Now, there's people who tell you that, uh, you know, Trinity is a false doctrine. Uh, well, you can say that, but the word Godhead is in the Bible. God made man in his image, and the Bible says man has a body, which is not your soul, which is not your spirit, which is not your body. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, Paul writes, 
and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's say in Isaiah 10, 18, and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. So, the Bible, even the Old Testament, records we have a soul and a body. Micah 6, 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Will I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? So, body, soul. Daniel 7, 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. So even the Old Testament records body, soul, and spirit. And if you want, you could read, you know, the New Testament too. I mean, it's, it's, it's just all over the place. So God, was, God made man in his image, and the Bible records that man has a body and a soul and a spirit. So why couldn't Christ in the flesh be like the body? And then the soul, which some people say is like your mind, that's likened unto God the Father, and then the Spirit, of course, is the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Just kind of throwing these things out there. So, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Bingo. Christ went, probably, my opinion, Christ went to Abraham's bosom and preached to all the Old Testament saints and brought them into faith to believe in him. And where are they now? Well, they're in, they're in heaven with him, right? Verse 20. Which sometime were disobedience when once the Long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the uh, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who is gone into heaven and is and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Bingo. Alright, so uh, after Christ preached to the spirits in prison, what happened? You know, third day, right? John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So... They ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes 
lie. But the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, was wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the sepulcher, that he must rise again from the dead. People, that's the, that's the gospel. Believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 10. John 20, verse 10. Then the disciples went away again unto their own house. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels, two angels in white, sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Okay? Don't touch me. Okay? Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the selfsame day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Ah! where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Contrast this with uh, Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Jesus breathed into them and uh, God breathed and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and God and man became a living soul. Right? John 20 and verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Who, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, 
and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Not Yeshua, Jesus. The New Testament was written in Greek, people. Greek, not Hebrew, not Aramaic. Greek was the common language of the people. When Jesus was speaking to Pilate, I will guarantee you he was not speaking to Pilate in Hebrew. He was either speaking to Pilate in Greek or Latin. Latin was the official language of the government, but Greek was the common language of that area in the Middle East because Alexander the Great had conquered that area. And I'll tell you what, when you get conquered by a, 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 a country, you're going to learn their language. All right, let's read Acts chapter 1. This former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to, and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. Until the day in which he was taken up. Taken up where? Into heaven. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now we're reading Acts chapter 1. Let's go to verse 6 now. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he saith unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come unto you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria. Samaria, the capital of is northern Israel, remember? They were divorced. Jeremiah 3.8. They were divorced. Israel was divorced. But they're going to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Christ was taken up into glory in a cloud. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, I, I believe these are angels which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. You know what? When Jesus comes again, he went up into heaven in the clouds. When he comes back, he's going to come in the clouds, and you're going to see them. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye 
gazing up into heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So, people, let me tell you something. If Christ doesn't return in, in the clouds of glory and every eye see him, it's the wrong Christ. It's the wrong Messiah. In Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Very important. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, this was when Jesus was taken into the trial by the high priest in Mark 14, verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now we're reading Mark 14, verse 61. Verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Oh boy. You want to make a... A, 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 a high priest angry? Well, there you go. All right, let's take a look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, which we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That's a euphemism for being dead. So those that are alive are not going to be pre prevent those that are dead in Christ from rising up. Uh, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Oh yeah, sounds like a secret rapture. There's always a secret rapture when you're shouting, right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the arch, arch, archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Very important. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. People, very important, if we're not caught up together in the clouds with the Lord as he's returning, it's the wrong Christ. It's the wrong Messiah. It's the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He comes before Christ does. I don't care what any church says if they tell you anything different. If we're not caught up in the clouds, it's the wrong 
Messiah. It's the wrong Christ. It says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I'm going to close this Bible study out with 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, and his Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen.